Welcome to our cross-border conversation, working across fiction and non-fiction in film and television post-production. How can you gain experience and recognition in both arenas? Thank you to our partners Genelec for supporting this series of talks and Brunel University London for technical delivery. So I'd like to hand to the first speaker, Anna, to take the conversation away. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful for having me as this always such amazing topic that you don't have one answer for this. So it's really interesting. I'm a film and TV editor from Poland, based in London. I went to film school in Poland. I used to live in America for a little bit and in France. So I travel a little bit and I'm an editor that cut who cut everything. So there's, I think, um, uh, documentaries, feature films, trailers, short films, reality TV, everything. You can have amazing stories in documentaries. You can find amazing stories in the news and obviously in drama. My name is Santi, uh, Santiago. Uh, I'm originally from Spain. I was uh, working as a freelance video editor for like, seven years since I moved to London in 2015. And in that time I did like more like commercial, um, corporate, I would say like, like music. And then after seven years of doing that, plus other artistic endeavors, I decided to focus more on film and TV because it's a quite a different world. Now I'm currently working as, an, an, as an, a media and assistant, edit assistant operator and in the post-production house Evolutions here in Bristol. Hi, my name's Richard. Uh, my pronouns are he and him. I'm a black man for um, those that need to know. And <laughs> yes, I'm a composer. Um, and yeah, I work, I've done work in corporate, um, art installations, documentaries, and started doing stuff with fiction, doing short films. Um, so the way I got started was um, a director that I met in at uni um, let me lose on one of his documentaries, um, which was about carnival, actually specifically about people that made costumes for carnival. So that was the first thing I did. And then, yeah, did a number of projects with him, some of them which um, were used by the Museum of London. And yeah, then recently started doing the fiction I'm Natasha, I'm also a composer. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with uh, shoulder length brown hair. So as a composer, I started off um, actually in the classical world. I began um, as a clarinetist and pursued classical training in that avenue and then moved into composing um, and then later on into uh, film and TV composition. So now I work um, I've worked mostly on short films um, in both fiction and non-fiction, um, but I still keep up my classical um, composition as well. So a wide variety of things. And what I found with doing like, you know, the factual versus fiction, obviously like the characters that you have are much stronger. Also, you know, within documentaries, there are gonna be characters within that that are part of the storytelling process. But obviously, within fiction, they're much stronger, and you have, there's a more of an identity, I guess, around them. I mean, definitely musically, as to, as to what you would do to uh, sort of identify with those characters. I mean, I went from doing one of the clips that we'll see at some point is one called Tough Blood, and that was about sickle cell. And so I was listening to lots of people talking about the the pain of of this disease and. Then the, the first fiction project I did was a a comedy. <laughs> so. So that was a bit of a baptism by fire, you know, trying to work out like like how how to to go around that one. I watched must have watched every dark comedy there was to try and kind of prepare for that. And and in the end, it was like you don't try and be funny with the music; you just try and tell the story and just kind of lean into that more so than trying to be funny as such with like musically. So that that I found tricky, sort of going from one extreme of. Um, factual work to that you know to, to comedy and fiction that was quite a bit of a challenge that was I was working as an assembly editor on uh, Crown it's fiction but it's based on a documentary right so so I thought that you know that this was actually the best example that 
uh, you can see totally different ways of of cutting the scene um, that you can uh, what you can get from the rushes. Thank you. Three, two, one, sir. Thank you. Three, two, one. William, keep smiling, darling. Three, two, one. Having reviewed the data, the pollsters have now presented their findings. Asked if the royal family were out of touch with ordinary people. 53% said yes. Asked if they were wasteful of public money. If they lacked compassion. 62% said yes. 9% said yes. The Prime Minister has a new nickname, King Tony. We must change not just the politics of this country, but the soul of this country. Boys need you now more than ever. I'm afraid we don't do fathers and sons very well in this family. Perhaps you don't like to be reminded how we got to this point. You can see the same stuff, very similar from BBC archives that that we were captured by uh, by reporters. And as a, I guess, news editor, you would cut basically. You know, you have to tell the story. Okay, there is a. Prince, he's coming out. There are lots of uh, of his young female fans, uh, and everyone is shocked. And you know, even as a, so, from the news, you would obviously you would have some voice over. You would be probably more interested in these girls because this is you know what people are interested in. And this, but for a, from a documentary, you would still look for the emotions, right? So you you would still look how he is, even if that was a documentary, because this is a fiction, right? But as a documentary editor, I would still look to make some emotions. I would still try to find, even if I didn't have it, because, you know, my DOP cinematographer didn't catch it, I would look, maybe we have something later or something uh, before, or, you know, just one moment, or even in a different day, that he is, like, really upset about it and shocked you know and and just being lonely and I think you know this is outcome of the scene when you are trying to cut the scene what you can get from the rushes and this is why of course uh you know your the the meaning of this was showing someone totally overwhelmed I'm just curious on the documentary bit like how do you because I guess in, in fiction it's more like scripted no so you have a script to follow do you have such a thing more with documentaries or there are different kinds of documentaries because I guess you have like a general maybe story that you want to tell but documentary is a lot uh, more like open I guess yes and I that's why I think uh I I just think that editors documentary editors are amazing storytellers because very often they have it or not they just have to make it, make to it happen. <laughs> the same also reality shows. And usually, yes, you have the script, you have an idea, but reality is you have no idea because, you know, especially when you uh, shoot something for a long time, you just didn't even know the outcome, what's going to happen. If you are like uh, uh, shooting as an observer, it's difficult to find out uh, what's going to happen. But Yes, you want to have a story. And when you see, like, when you watch, like, today's Netflix documentaries, they really look like, uh, like you know, like proper. Yeah, yeah. Right? And I think the best uh, thing that I've learned in my film school was my documentary teacher, um, an old lady uh, who was uh, also working with Kieślowski. And at, even at this time, like, you know, long long time ago she said that that you want to cut documentaries that they feel like drama you know and i think this this is such a good good um good rule for yeah. good advice one thing that i learned from doing like documentary work especially working with Stephen, was um people assume that you get a picture and then you write the music to it and then you <laughs> you go back and forth a little bit and then it's done but um, often they are 
they're changing things while you're writing it. <laughs> so, uh -huh. and then that's always fun. Um, I mean, we can have a look at a clip um, of a project called Tough Blood. So that was originally a kind of installation, but live performance. And so I originally had to go and write with the people. So it was like a collaboration. Um, so it's kind of part documentary, part performance. It's like a dancer, choreographer, and director. There was images projected on the screen. And so I had to write while they were creating the, the choreography because they wanted it to be collaborative. So I did a lot of it that way. And then I kind of went off, wrote a bit more, sent it back. I'd see what they were doing. And then they, I'd, they'd say, yeah, that's great. Cool. And then they would then say, oh, we've just taken this little bit out <laughs> that you just composed. So you'd have to kind of keep like chopping things around. And that that was really good training for sort of working on fictions where things are changing and learning how to sort of reconform things and, and work in that way. If it comes in your chest, it's like your chest is on fire. I can't break it down into words. It's not literally fire, it just feels like something's just constantly just ripping at your chest. Like, keep just, it's like they're pulling it in, back in, pulling it out and in. Your chest, so it's like your chest has been ripped out and then put back in again, so it's just, so you take a painkiller thinking, oh my gosh, it's going to help. When I did that one, Stephen um, tends not to like very overt emotional statements musically. So I kind of had to kind of do emotion by stealth and kind of sneak some strings in there. And you know, like by the end, it's like, where'd that quartet come from? You know, um, one of the things, you know, you look out for and you look out for little cues. And it's the same thing with story, you know, fiction is looking out for clues to kind of help you when you're composing. So one of the things was um, uh, one of the um, the young women was talking about that she would want to talk about um, having sickle cell and people often wanted to kind of change the subject. And so I kind of wanted to kind of bring out that a bit more, like make sure they were heard and like the emotion of it. So that was kind of important to me. And it's kind of those little pleas you kind of look out for that like a storytelling points that you can kind of use musically. When we opened, we, we weren't able to get into the building until pretty much, well, I wasn't until they opened it. And um, I kind of went in there and there was no ceiling. <laughs> and so the acoustics in a hovel. And so I basically had to, luckily I walked to my laptop and I had stems, so the individual parts of the music. And so I had to basically mix it again about an hour before the performance opened because it was just, it just didn't sound right. So it was one of those situations where you didn't have time to get stressed because you were just too busy trying to, <laughs> trying to get on with it. But that was an interesting one to do because with that one, it was kind of establishing, I guess, what sickle cell is, some of the people that were involved, their experiences, and then looking at outcomes. And working in documentaries kind of trained me to work with dialogue because there was a lot of um, dialogue. I found whether I'm working on fiction or non-fiction projects, um, the main thing that I have in the forefront of my mind is what story are we trying to tell here and also the emotional impact of that story what's being conveyed what would the director like to be conveyed or highlighted um through the music uh, so that is usually how i approach projects in either genre to be honest this is from a documentary um called the blackfish effect That um, documentary was about the impact of another documentary, it's a little bit meta, um, about the impact of the documentary Blackfish uh. on um, the kind of sea life industry, that's not really the right word, but you know what I mean, <laughs> sort of water parks and the keeping of killer whales in captivity yes. and 
um, it included a lot of, um, as you said, Richard, there was a lot of talking. Um, there are a lot of clips from experts, um, kind of a lot of dialogue with uh, images overlaid. There was a slight challenge there in terms of trying to still be expressive with the music, but also not overpower um, the dialogue and not distract from the dialogue. So I also went down a bit more of an ambient route with that um, track. Most of the music to the documentary sounded quite like the clip, but I also wanted to kind of incorporate, there are some water-like sounds in there as well to just sort of capture that theme. And I tried to imitate as well the kind of sounds of marine life, kind of the calls of killer whales in some of the sort of string glissandos that you could maybe hear there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah definitely got that. Yeah. Uh -huh. So that was kind of the atmosphere that we were trying to create with the with the score for that one. And again, it was um an interesting project to work on. The um edit kept changing. Um as composers we can be brought in at various different points um in a yeah. project and for this one um I was brought in while they were still finalizing the edit so there was a cut that I originally started working on and then a new version would arrive and maybe some scenes were changed or added or removed and you have to kind of be very flexible then with long, um the music I was gonna say how long did you have to work on it in the end um that one was a pretty tight let me think sorry it was a few years ago <laughs> I'm trying to remember um I think I had a few weeks about a month in total um to to work on that and it was um about 15 minutes long and there was music throughout most of um the the film how do you usually work do you have um, do they do you like to do it on your own and have some ideas or do you like sometimes editor to have some ideas for your what's your favorite style um, like when you because I know that sometimes I put lots of temp music and uh, and I and then I I prefer to give it clean you know to the uh, composer uh, and this way they can come up with some ideas or sometimes I don't know okay I love this can you just you know change something <laughs> um honestly I kind of like a bit of both it's always useful to know um I think where the director might be coming from in terms of their inspiration for the music and sort of uh if there are any particular ideas or if there is a, a particular temp track that maybe a scene was cut to that might give an idea of the um, kind of focal points, but also it um, it's important to have, I think, creative freedom as well. So I've had the experience before where um, a director has been very, very wedded to a temp track to the point where they've basically just wanted me to copy it, uh -huh. which that can be an interesting dynamic to then navigate as a composer, um, trying to put your own creative voice in there as well so honestly I think the ideal is somewhere in the middle right because also if there's very little guidance I find that can be tricky as well to come up with something that everybody is happy with and that really conveys the kind of intended um I don't know impact of the film um what would you say to that Richard do you think do you have a way you'd prefer to work um yeah I know what you mean um yeah, it's tricky if there's nothing there at all. You know, you know, it's it's too much of a blank canvas. I mean, sometimes you know, I've had one time someone said, "I'll oh, just do what you feel." I, I'm not sure, and and actually they I've had that too. <laughs> yeah, and then it turns out they are sure. But sometimes what they want is something to rule out almost. Mm -hmm. So out of your little experiment might help them to kind of decide what they want, if that makes sense. So that can be helpful, um, but also like. You know, I've, I've like you, I've done some stuff which has been remote and I find it's completely different. Like when you play something, when someone's in the room, I don't know if you're just kind of feeling their energy, but it just feels different. You st you hit play and you're like, oh, this is not working. Because <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can just kind of get a sense, you, you know, their body language and anything a little bit more. So, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, a little bit of temp is not, it's not bad. As, like you say, as long as they're not wedded to it too much, then it can become a struggle to kind of 
and kind of work around that sometimes. It's good to know some kind of like direction at least anyway. Yeah, that's why, uh, you know, it's really good to have those music spots. I think I find them really amazing because this is actually, I mean, then I really struggle with my English and just under, but just it's hard for me to express uh, what I need sometimes, you know, in emotions. But I, I find them um, just watching the scenes with everyone in the room, director, producers, assistants, and then, oh, we should do this, you know, and composer, they come up with ideas. Usually they're like, I know, I know, I know exactly what I want. And I just always I find it really, really amazing. Yeah, I find it helpful just, to, I remember, yeah, someone was trying to describe, sort of describe musically what they want, and I and he was struggling about. I said, "Well, tell me how you want people to feel when they leave." And then he started giving me some like words, which then, if I do, you know what I mean? You kind of brought out some emotion in me, and then I was able to kind of feed off that. So we kind of did a little back and forth in terms of like just describing the emotion of what 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 they wanted, and that kind of helped. I know, I, I guess understanding outcome what do you want what particular scene i think this is very uh important word but what particular scenes means you know what you want if it's just like you know just the beginning what do you want to highlight what is important when you you know when the story is actually developing when you don't want a repetition i think this is once you guys composers understand this i think this is much easier and for everyone to to follow the story. So that was from a fiction project that I worked on recently, um, which was called Souffle, um, and it was about two best friends, um, one of which had just gone through a bad breakup, the other one was supporting her. Uh, the friend who had gone through the breakup was panic baking souffles, hence the title. Um, yeah. So it kind of, it had a few more serious themes, but also there was a lightheartedness to it. You really got the sense that these two characters um, were very close. They had a kind of easy, jokey sort of manner between them. And it was a very intimate setting. Everything took place within a flat, um, just two rooms of a flat um, and just the two characters. So it, I really tried to emphasise that with the music. It's a much smaller scale, The um, especially if you compare to my last track. Um, there are nowhere near as many instruments, um, so it's a lot more kind of paired back, a lot um, closer. But I think in terms of approach, um, I really did approach it in a similar way to my other projects. I don't think the fact that it was fiction necessarily informed that it was more the actual story that was being told that kind of brought about those differences in the score um, rather than whether the story was true or not. But then I suppose in the case of that film, while the film was fictional, the actual um, sort of scenario is something that many people will have experienced. So I suppose there's a bit of a blurred line there as well. The next clip we're going to look at was called, um, it was again another installation, which was then made into a, a short film called Black Men's Mind. So Stephen is, uh, I'm going to get his title wrong, is he a psychotherapist or psychologist? I've forgotten <laughs> the actual one, So, um, which he, he got qualified as later. And so one of the things he wanted to look at was specifically mental health with um, some young black men because men generally don't talk about it and the black community wasn't really talked about much at all. It is a bit more now, so he kind of focused on that area. Um, but this was like pretty much wall-to-wall -wall dialogue. So it ended up being very, very um, textual because it was just trying to <laughs> trying to find ways to kind of do something without doing too much and drawing attention to, uh, away from what was being said. This guy is talking about um, when he was going through a schizophrenic episode and having this out-of-body experience. It's horrible. I could see and hear the things I was saying and doing. I couldn't stop it. Like there's two people experiencing it. I was experiencing like an inward me and the outward me was stepping. It was an outside guy. What's going on?
I think I might have got a little bit of help from Stephen there. I think he might have cut some things to what I did. I think we kind of went back and forth, which was which was a bit of luck. And then I kind of used a very, very long reverb at the end because I had these kind of cluster chords happening, like doing these rises. And I had, I think it was a choir that came in at the end. And then just used a long reverb to transition between that and the C. Because, and in fact, I heard an actor talking about this, just um, talking about being um, bipolar. And he said that's the wrong word because he said it's not like by anything. He, he, said, he said for him, it's like he can only really experience extreme highs or extreme lows. And so having that contrast, again, sort of looking for those clues to kind of guide you musically um, were, were kind of helpful to kind of think about. Like, that's why I kind of had that kind of big transition between that big riser and then to that sea rushing at you, but, but very, very calmly. Right now, at the moment, I'm doing a lot of assistant uh, work. So I'm not maybe working in particular. Uh, I haven't been editing so much. So I had this really big sense of like, I want to try and make documentaries. And I wasn't sure still, like, how do I get into editing documentaries? How do, do I make documentaries? What do I do? So I just got my camera and, and found two friends that really inspired me that were living in a in a boat in the London canals. And I just did like a little film portrait of them. My first boat was when I was 19. Then I moved on land for a bit and then I needed to go back on a boat. I just knew that I had to. It feel, I think it keeps you more present in, in many points of... People are so used to pressing a button or a switch or something and just have heating, have anything, and you don't question yourself, where does it come from? Welcome to Isla. Yeah, I come very fond of the boat. It's really another person mm. it's the third wheel in our yes. relationship yes. <laughs> mm. because if she's not working then we're not necessarily working yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Pete, a lot of people they say oh i can do that i think everyone could live on a boat mm, yeah. and once you get into that rhythm you'll just love it mm. i think yeah That was kind of my, uh, I filmed that with them. So that was kind of my first um, work in terms of diving a little bit more into like actually dire directing it or interviewing them and deciding what I want to film. And then also um, editing it after. And then the music as well, because she was actually, she's a composer herself, uh, Lucy, the girl in the video. And we just recorded the music all together in a music studio in Valencia back in Spain because she was studying there and I just went to visit them. So it's all really, uh, I don't know, handmade, like made at home, like we would say in Spain. <laughs> but I really liked it in the end. It was really lovely uh, to make it and it did really taught me a lot. And it was actually quite difficult because you don't have any directions, as you said, Natasha, like, it was just me wanting to make a portrait of them, but I didn't have anyone telling me, oh, this is what I want, or this is the feeling I'm going for. So I remember having a lot of time just in front of the computer once I was going to edit and be like, Phew. like, okay, what do I do now? It was a bit overwhelming, but it did help me a lot to learn how to make decisions and get rid of things. Like sometimes, you know, you get attached to certain parts of the film and, at the end, you have to be really strong and be like, well, it's actually not working with the whole thing. So even though I really like it, uh, it has to go. So when you so you did that one on your own, so when you came to work as a director, did you find that you really appreciated having that somebody else to kind of help you with? Like, the Yeah, editing? I mean, that's something I always had as a, like working in corporate or even, even like music, there's always a story as well. Like, you know, a promoter that wants to tell a certain story as well or things like that, or, or just the, the musician itself or the, the band so i i was more used to that so suddenly going to a project that is like well okay i filmed it i i'm gonna edit it I'm, i interview them and it's a bit like yeah where do i want to go with this so it makes you ask yourself a lot of questions 
now I'm I'm working, I would say more in a technical role as an assistant. So I'm learning loads and I'm learning a lot about the process of film and TV and how to how it works, you know. Assisting actually is helping me a lot to to see. Uh, which I guess I can see everyone told me when I wanted to go into ed editing, I was like, oh, I want to edit film and TV. They were like, yeah, you're, you're going to have to assist. And I was like, why? Like I've been editing uh, and now being assisting, I'm like, okay, yeah, like this, there's, there's more stuff that is useful to see before you actually jump and dive in, which I'm sure you can do. And then the struggle in the first project or two a lot, uh, and then get better. fired yeah yeah probably you'll have quite <laughs> traumatic, <laughs> traumatic experiences at the beginning <laughs> if you survive um so yeah i'm really liking that as well um and it's a different way of seeing things like you see them working and you catch up on things that they're doing like i can see myself watching it now and be like oh and also because i've been familiarized with the footage and i've been ingesting it and i've been labeling it and i've been doing all that i'm like oh they went for these but not for these you know this is not this didn't make it in there and i kind of wonder the decisions why and, and if i can add something um the best example uh we spoke about it um that zone of interest uh, it's a new movie the cinematographer who is Łukasz Żal, it's a Polish cinematographer. He was a documentary cinematographer and he had a break on Ida, Oscar winning Polish film uh, directed by Paweł Pawlikowski. And every break, when you try to achieve something new, you know, you just have to go with the flow and just follow your passion. I think every story is amazing. And no matter if you are working on corpo or documentary or short films, every, just do your best job, just tell the best story you can. And hopefully this will pay off because your director who just cut this short film is gonna get another break and then they will take you with you. So I think no matter what, just doing something, uh, just cutting or composing music, I guess, makes you more experience and i think you can learn from every little thing so just don't give up and follow your dreams i mean it's easy to say <laughs> but yeah right now i'm in an assistant place so i'm still kind of wondering about where should i go next or how will i manage when, once i start you know editing and and working in different kind of genres but i would say yeah just just be open and just don't be scared of maybe like sometimes you even need to push yourself a little bit more because it's easier to stay with the same thing so sometimes even if someone comes and says like oh you want to do this thing and it's really different sometimes it's a bit like oh i don't know but just just jump i'd just say lean into the versatility i think um it can be very easy to think that um, in these industries everyone has to have one thing that they specialize in and that um, that's the only thing that you're allowed to do but actually I think being able to work across lots of different um, genres and areas of the industry is a strength so I think it can be important actually to embrace that and emphasize that there are lots of transferable skills across many different um, areas of the industry so yeah embrace it lean in <laughs> I try to put, say, if I contact someone, it's what you want to do is do like a specific reel for whatever project that they're going for. So try and find something within what you have that is like appropriate for their project. So you could have like different reels or initially what I did was where well, I've got my private page with things I can't share publicly. I put certain things at the top. So I contact someone and I'm going there and reshuffle things. So whatever was most suitable for their project appeared at the top. To like, oh right, he does that, you know. So, you know, that kind of thing can help. Um, and you know, if you can get on a short film as well, do you know what I mean? And, and then, you know, no matter what you do, you treat it like it's Oppenheimer. <laughs> do you know what I mean? So, so, so just do. Do you know what I mean? Just throw everything at it because then that is your calling card for the next bigger thing. Do you see what I mean? So. That's that's kind of one way of doing it, I guess. In my experience, they've been pretty open, um, to be honest. Uh, my uh, credits are actually quite balanced. I've done 
uh, two fiction and two factual projects exactly. So um, at least there's something to show there um, for me that I am capable of uh, working across both. Um, but then, uh, as Richard said, I think just really spelling it out can be helpful in your application or in your communications with um, directors and producers, even if it is as obvious as literally saying, I have done this, therefore I'm capable of doing this, you know, <laughs> um, just to kind of really, I think sometimes if you've got a bit of an eclectic CV, as as I know I have, especially with the classical stuff in there as well, it can be helpful to just um, be as clear as you possibly can. Um, but then I've, I've found that um, once the conversations have gotten started, um, that people have been fairly open. When I've been teaching, that's taught me a lot of patience and managing different behaviours. And do, do you know what I mean? That has all been very helpful <laughs> in dealing with people when they're kind of like super stressed. So every, everything that you do is useful in, do you know what I mean, in the next thing that you're going to do, I would say. Your work as a documentary editor, it wins BAFTA and you know or short gets nominated and then people get you already credited you're amazing and you know but it's just very much dependent on luck uh but i really think that things are changing you know now like uh knowing that it's not like long time ago we had okay that is documentary and this is fake affection and now everything you know having we are just used to just watching so many different things that uh, really and people are trying to find out different uh, formats of showing, you know, telling the stories to make people interested. So I really think that um, I, I was approached and I was working on a, a documentary drama hybrid. I was just working in, uh, as for drama elements, but I think... I was chosen because of my experience. So it can be can be that I was the right person because I was the I wasn't scared of going through, you know, the factual rushes and also doing my drama bits because that was a mixing. And I think um and I think, you know, just do a good job. J just tell a good story. Thank you to our speakers for such a fascinating and informative talk. We look forward to seeing you at the next ScreenCraft Works event.